We're talking about rope today. In fact, do you know why you would choose this rope over, well, any of the other ropes here on my table? Well, if not, stay tuned because in just a few minutes, you're gonna know more than 99% of people in the world about rope. You should probably see this video as a rope basics video. We're gonna talk about a lot of different things related to why you would choose one rope over another. And all of that really kind of relates back to where the rope came from, where it started its life. I have been making videos about knots for a long time. Essential climbing knots, pull it tight and get hauled up the cliff. And this is not a video about that. You can though check out our knots for beginners, which you can Google search. Uh, we'll have a whole playlist set up there. We're also not gonna talk about how to make your own rope, which I have done a few times in the past like this. But if you're interested in that, check out this link right here and down in the description. We should probably just get out of the way this terminology. We're talking about rope here, but you could also call it cordage. Like you have paracord here, which is really small rope. Sometimes people say cordage when they're talking about smaller diameter rope. And if you're on a boat, you don't call things rope, you would call them lines. If you have extra line, but those are all just many different names for what is essentially the same thing. Now let's start with the three main types of rope that you'll come across. Uh, the first one would be some sort of twisted rope. It's just a way of making the rope. This is double twisted, so it's just two different pieces of fiber that are twisted around each other. This one is three strands that are twisted together multiple times. This is a very common way of doing traditional rope. This is manila rope. I'll get to this one back in a second. Then you can have braided rope like this, where there's a whole bunch of different strands that are braided around each other. And you can't really make this on your own. This is made in a giant machine in a factory and it does an elaborate dance and they go around each other, which is pretty cool. And this one is what's called hollow braid. So that means there's nothing inside. That's different than kermantled rope. So climbing rope is kermantled rope, which means it has an outer braid over an inner core. And let me show you a small version of that. Now this is, this is just the same as this bigger climbing rope. It's just a little smaller. You can see the outer sheath, inner nylon strands right there. That means it can take some wear on this outer braid and then the inner ones retain all their strength. So that's pretty good. All right, now to what I think is the most interesting, and that's looking at the material of these ropes. So if you were to divide up all the rope into two main categories, you would have natural fiber ropes. That would be everything they used back in the day uh, from natural materials. And then you have all the man-made synthetic ropes, which are made from synthetic fibers. And we'll get to those at the end. But first, natural fibers. This is a collection of natural fiber ropes. Uh, why don't I just start with this one? This is the most traditional probably. Uh, this is the manila rope. Now the reason they call this manila rope is that it's made mostly in Manila of the Philippines. That's the capital of the Philippines. And they have a plant there called the abaca plant. It's not the banana that we eat, but it's a plant in the banana family. And they have long fibers. And there's lots of videos on YouTube which you can search up and you can see how this process is made. Essentially, they're pulling out all of those long strands, drying them out, and then they turn them into this rope. Now what's great about this particular fiber is that it's resistant to degradation in salt water. And it's also pretty strong. And that's why it was used in sailing for just a long time. Now, if you've ever used traditional rope like this manila rope, you'll know that it's sometimes really hard on the hands. I mean, this is really rough. So if you're using it over long periods of time and it's running through your hands, you're gonna not have a very good day. I would say the main downside of this though is that just like all natural fibers, over time and exposure to moisture, it will break down. Then you have hemp. Hemp like this is made from the fibers of the cannabis plant. Big surprise. Which means you can have an industry around cannabis if you can grow it in your area that is unrelated to the other ways cannabis can be used. And I mention it only because a lot of people don't really know how awesome this plant is at making twine and rope and cordage. Other commonly available natural fibers include coir, which is from the fibers of coconuts. Sisal is from the fibers of agaves. And then you have jute, which is from a few different species in the Malvaceae family, the mallow family. And they're commonly referred to as jute mallow. 
Believe it or not, jute is really fantastic to have if you're trying to start a fire because you can kind of scrape off some of this stuff, turn it into something like this. And this is the most amazing tinder. You can hit this with a spark and it will just go up in flames like nobody's business. So this is actually something I put in my fire kit. Cotton is also in the mallow family. And you know, cotton like this does make good rope. Haley uses this to tie up her bread loaves. It's not super strong. It's probably one of the weaker of the ropes, but for decorative purposes, it's really handy. I mean, this is where it can be really important to know general botany because I thought to myself, well, we have oak Okra. okra is also in the Malvaceae family. I wonder if you can make rope out of okra. And it turns out you totally can. And we grow that every summer, so I'm gonna try that in the future. Now that was some of the main ones you can get in the store, but understand that any plant that has long fibers can be made into rope. So some of the plants that are commonly made into rope include dogbane, milkweed, nettles, flax, cattails, yucca, Douglas iris, the inner bark of willows, maple, basswood, and cedar, just to name a few. But by all means, do not let that stop you from experimenting. For instance, last year, we had wisteria vines growing all over the place, and I thought to myself, these are really long vines. I wonder if I could pound the outer bit of the stem and pull the fibers out. And turns out, I made some pretty good rope out of it. And that's the video I linked to down in the description. All right, now to the synthetics. I need to start this by saying you can't just grab a random rope that's different colors, it's clearly a synthetic, and know exactly what it's made out of. Because oftentimes synthetics are slight variations of different polymers that are turned into fibers and strung into rope, and they can feel very similar, but they're actually different types. But when you go to the hardware store, you will look at all the different ones and you will see different names on the packages. And that is why I'm doing this video because if you look at the package and you see polyester, then you can know a little bit about what you're looking at. Now I can't get to all the different variations, but I'll start with just a few. First, nylon. Nylon itself is a generic term for related polymers. The first name branded and patented nylon was Dacron. But there are lots of different types of nylon. Now I wanna use nylon as an example of how other synthetic fibers are also made. Uh, Jonas and Louise, who I shoot all my videos with, did a video particularly on the chemistry of making nylon. So where there was a chemical reaction in a little glass beaker. And out of that, they could pull these long fibers, these long strands of nylon. And those strands can then be spun into twine and then made into rope. Now nylon is way stronger than natural fibers and it's actually a little bit stretchy. That means it holds energy well and it can be used in things like anchor lines, dock lines, and mooring lines. Because if you've ever had a boat, and I used to live on a sailboat, when that cord hits the end, you don't want it to be just be a solid stop. You want it to just give a little bit. So nylon's really good for that. The main problem with that stretchiness though is that if nylon stretches to its maximum amount and then snaps, that energy just whiplashes back. And we actually had that when we were trying to take down a tree in the yard. We, we had the bobcat tied up to a nylon rope to the tree and the whole tree was way stronger than we thought. So when it snapped back, it came with just so much force. Now polyester is a premium synthetic fiber and it's often what you will find on sailboats. It's what I had all of my lines made out of on my sailboat. And that's because unlike nylon, it's very low stretch and it maintains its strength when it's wet. And of course, that's why it was ideal for these boating situations like on my rigging lines. Polypropylene. Polypropylene rope floats in the water and that's why it is ideal for boating situations like having a tow rope. This is my ski rope. So when I do slalom skiing, I'm using polypropylene. It'll float on the surface, the whole rope doesn't sink, which is fantastic. It also um, stretches a little bit. So for a ski rope, that's good because if I'm doing slalom skiing and I'm going out to the edge and I'm going around a buoy and then I pull, I want it to load up that force and then it springs you back across the wake. It's just a good way to think about it. Now the main problem with polypropylene rope is that it will break down over time in UV light. So this is a good reason that you would not put your ski rope out on the back of your boat and just leave it there. You wanna put it under a seat. You wanna just get it out of the sunlight. Um, and I've had many ski ropes break on me. Now here's another polypropylene rope that I had out in the yard hanging up on a hook. And I'm just gonna show you, this is only just a couple of years old. Uh, watch how easily this breaks. Oh, this one's a little harder. 
It is ridiculous how brittle this is. Ay, ay, ay. And generally, I would say those are the main types that you will see at a hardware store or when you're trying to look for your own rope. But of course, there's lots of different variations of these. So this is a wakeboarding rope. And unlike the polypropylene rope, which floats on the water, this doesn't float. It has an outer sheath that they put on it to kind of make it float a little bit. But this line here is not stretchy at all. And when you're wakeboarding, you don't want it to be stretchy because you want to quickly make turns and not have like a delay. Right? I, it's hard to explain it. Specialty rope named Dyneema. And you can get other specialty ones out of polyethylene and Spectra. But the point is that there are a lot of different name brands and variations of synthetic fibers that you can create. And these synthetic fibers are fantastic. Some of them are stronger than steel and they're flexible and super strong. But I wanted to go through those main ones so that you could just see the variation in synthetics and natural fibers. I will say also that I try to use natural fibers as much as I can, in part because I like the feel of having natural rope. But if I need something that's strong and reliable, like the paracord uh, that I would use to set up my tarp lines uh, or for survival situations, my climbing rope, I would never use natural fiber ropes because they just break down too quickly and could risk putting me in danger. I'm just mentioning some of the positives and the negatives so you can get a feel for what you are gonna choose when you're out there at the hardware store trying to pick your rope. If you like this video on rope basics, give it a thumbs up. Also, you might enjoy learning about how to make your own rope. You can check that video out up here. Also just want to say a big thanks to my patrons who are continually supporting this at a dollar or two or more a month because let's face it, YouTube doesn't pay very much and I enjoy creating material that's accessible for everyone, uh, no matter if you can afford it or not. All right, thanks everybody. We'll see you in the next one.